healthcare fraud enforcement. I see we call it the final frontier, but is this really the final frontier? No. Yes. <laughs> For my sake, I hope not. Uh, but really happy to have Jack Seld moderating this panel. Jack's at Bradley Aaron in Birmingham. Uh, as many of you know, Jack served as an assistant United States attorney in the United States attorney for the Northern District of Alabama. Very well known uh, throughout the Southeast and the country for his practice in healthcare and specifically False Claims Act matters. And, and as many of you know, uh, very well known for his great work in the Acera Care case, which we're all eagerly anticipating. Still I think waiting. We had the same conversation last year. We were expecting a ruling uh, from the 11th Circuit any day and, and still don't have one. Uh, but Jack has been a great uh, friend of, of this program and has, has been here, I think, just about every year and has led similar discussions and has really put together a fantastic panel this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Jack Selden. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to everyone. Um, we've really got a terrific panel here. I'm very excited about the experience level of these folks and uh, the conversations we've been having in, in preparation. So let me go ahead and introduce them, then we'll jump right in. Um, immediately next to me is uh, Tom Clarkson, who's an assistant United States attorney uh, in Savannah, in the Southern District of uh, Georgia. Uh, Tom um, uh, has been in that office since June of 2014, so for over five years. Uh, he served as the civil and criminal health care fraud coordinator, affirmative civil enforcement coordinator, and deputy chief. Uh, Tom graduated from the University of Notre Dame, received his law degree from the University of Georgia. Uh, following graduation, he served as a law clerk uh, to the Honorable Judge uh, Joe Flatt on the 11th Circuit, and then worked as an associate at a law firm in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Uh, Tom has a tremendous amount of expertise in healthcare fraud matters, and he is cross-designated in his office of uh, both civil and criminal. Uh, next to Tom is Katie McDermott, uh, probably hardly needs an introduction, uh, partner at Morgan Lewis, uh, both in the DC and the Boston offices. Uh, truly, I, I think one of the most well-recognized uh, and experienced litigators in healthcare fraud case, cases nationwide <coughs> over quite a few years. She's also a former uh, assistant US attorney. She served at Maine Justice uh, as a healthcare fraud coordinator uh, Katie, you're the recipient of too many awards to even go through them. Um, and she certainly works in all areas of, of uh, healthcare law and healthcare fraud allegations, whether it's criminal, civil, or, or administrative. Uh, next to Katie uh, is Kirk Ogroski. Uh, this is Kirk's first time at this conference, and uh, we're certainly thrilled to have him. Uh, he's a partner at Arnold and Porter in the DC office. Um, Kirk also has an extraordinary background in healthcare litigation, uh, both in private practice as well as in the Department of Justice. Uh, in another life, he served as the uh, uh, Deputy Chief of the Fraud Section within the Criminal Division uh, from 06 to 2010. He was an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of Florida from 99 to 05, and an Assistant uh, Attorney General in Kentucky as well in 07, he created the Medicare Fraud Strike Force uh, that most of us are quite uh, familiar with at this point. Um, uh, finally, at the end, and certainly not least, is Jason Pop. Jason is a partner at the law firm of Austin Bird here in Atlanta um, in their litigation group. Uh, Jason also has uh, substantial experience in uh, healthcare litigation. Uh, primarily Civil False Claims Act, but other areas as well, some criminal. He's had other criminal experiences as well, such as FCPA. Um, uh, and, and I'll mention, uh, if I may, that you have an upcoming argument uh, in the Third I, Circuit. I do, and I hope the Acera Care opinion does not come out before then, um, <laughs> because we've got the same case going to the Third Circuit on Tuesday, so that would throw things in a flux. Well, best of luck on that now. Thank you. Um, that's a, uh, an important case. Uh, I'm gonna try to stay out of the way. We've got a number of topics that we want to uh, discuss. I'll say in, the, in our planning calls that we had, um, 
I was so impressed with the group, and I've known uh, most of them meeting Tom for the first time, uh, that unbeknownst to them, as I was trying to think of hypotheticals, they were really some of my cases, and I was getting great advice. <laughs> I was tempted to bill the time for the panel call, but didn't. Um, uh, but I kept finding myself thinking, you know, maybe I'll float this out there and um, really have learned a great deal from the group. Um, so a number of topics we put down, we, we will try to reach as many as we can. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about some healthcare uh, fraud enforcement priorities, uh, some important, at least several important FCA cases here over uh, in 2019 uh, or late 2018. Uh, some new DOJ policies uh, that are out there and their implication uh, in relation to these cases and how they're handled, what strategies def the defense side may have Try to touch on medical necessity, another hot topic, particularly in the False Claims Act area. Uh, we'd like to uh, touch upon, and I think we will, the issue of um, sampling and extrapolation in those cases. Uh, and if we can get to it, we wanna talk a little bit about uh, what is perceived as an increased use by CMS of suspension, uh, their suspension authority in, in uh, correspondence with the Department of Justice as they investigate uh, both criminally and civilly. Well, let's start off first with uh, issues of uh, criminal priorities in healthcare. And Tom, I'd like to call on you. The, the, you weren't here yesterday. There've been some discussion on panels about the op opioid crisis, mm -hmm. but not really from the prosecutor's standpoint. And we know it's a big issue. Yeah. Would you talk about that for a few minutes? Sure, happy to. And uh, you know, just disclaimer, anything I say can be used against me, but please don't use it against Mike Cranston. Uh, there's going to be no Clarkson memo that should be resulting from this conference, so uh, please hold off on the Twitter. Um, yeah, I, th I think that without question, the opioid prosecutions are going to continue to be a focus. In Savannah, we've got a cross-designated group, as Jack mentioned, criminal and civil. The idea is at its kind of bottom line is to try to bring all the tools that we have to bear on this problem. Um, I think a couple things of note, um, again, keeping it at a high level, knowing some other folks have touched on this. Uh, you know, what's driving our kind of strategy is in, in this kind of uh, multifaceted approach uh, kind of begins and ends with data. We're, we're finding uh, our outlier pill mill physicians, whether that's through the PDMP data or internal government data uh, from the claim side. We're identifying the pill mills. We're taking that pill mill data, uh, you know, figuring out how to work the case up from a physician perspective. We're taking the next step and we're finding the pharmacies that are filling for those physicians. Uh, from the pharmacy level, we're then taking that, uh, the third step to the distributor supplier level to try to figure out a comprehensive way to, to attack the problem. Uh, physicians, as, as the US Attorney may have mentioned earlier, uh, we've indicted a number of medical professionals this year. I think it's you know more than we have in the past 10 years combined. Uh, <clears throat> certainly the physicians, we're also going after uh, licensed medical professionals who are diverting in some way. So that may include uh, PAs, nurses who are uh, stealing from you know, hospitals, uh, even if it's personal use. I know that um, has received some, some inconsistent treatment. But depending on the circumstances, we will uh, pursue felony charges against medical professionals for personal use diversions. I think that's consistent with some of the other districts. I know some others um, may take a slightly different approach. And, and in circumstances, the U.S. Attorney will entertain a civil resolution to that. And the reason for that is really to keep an emphasis on the importance of the medical professionals. They're gatekeepers um, on a pharmacy level. Uh, you know, they're, we, you know, the corresponding responsibility, we're holding them to the same standard. We indicted, uh, or we had two criminal investigations resulting from, like I said, where we had identified a physician, we indicted him. We identified the, the pharmacies that continued to fill for him after it became known that he was a pill mill. We investigated those. It turns out one of them just had a giant fraud scheme on, on his own. Uh, he was indicted for that. Uh, another one uh, we pursued criminally, and there's about five or six more that we're pursuing civilly. The second point I wanna make about the opioid um, investigations, which I think will have a bigger role, and I'm interested to see how it plays out in, in a multi-phase approach. You um, probably have heard about the ARPO, the Appalachian Regional, Regional Task Force. Uh, there was a significant takedown in April resulting in the number of charges. I think there was another one um, maybe not ARPO related, I think it was Texas and Miami last week. Uh, it's gonna continue to be a focus. The interesting thing about the ARPO, 
They created the task force. What we've seen, though, is that they are pulling resources, particularly Asia resources, from existing places. There was not an allocation for, say, a new crop of HHS agents. So we have seen in our area where they're pulling resources into this Appalachian region, which, you know, understanding is a significant kind of ground zero for the impact. But I think it will be interesting to see in kind of the, you know, 12, 18 month time horizon, uh, whether they're backfilling the resources that they're using to kind of staff that up, whether that continues. Um, the HHS prides themselves. You kind of hear them at a lot of their conferences. The OIG, I think they return $7 for every one expended. Uh, I think it will be interesting to watch as those cases, which probably don't have the same return on investment from dollars coming back into the program perspective, uh, if they uh, figure out a different metric to kind of measure, measure their success. But um, top to bottom, opioid prosecutions from whether it's a medical professional uh, standpoint or um, you know, if you're looking at the companies, the distributors, I think is going to continue to be a focus in Georgia and, and elsewhere. Tom, thank you. And let me ask the rest of the panel in terms of any observations you have criminally in regard to uh, the opioid situation, but also civilly, uh, how this situation might be used or is being used or what you anticipate in terms of uh, False Claims Act possibilities. Sure. So we're, we're seeing an uptick at, in the civil prosecution of it. But one thing Tom mentioned that um, I think as everyone's seeing here is that it's such a dramatic public interest that it makes for a terrible jury case for, for the defendant. And I've got one right now that's, that's a civil case, it's just a CSA diversion case, and we've had spirited debates about whether there was true diversion or whether it's just a record keeping issue. And now we're at the settlement discussions and instead of talking about the merits, what they tell me is, pop, get a better offer from your client, tell them to turn on 60 Minutes, tell them to open the Wall Street Journal, tell them to read the New York Times cover page, and it's like, okay, I get it. It's, it's not a good jury case, but it, it makes it difficult to, to tackle. But I think we'll also see an uptick in the KETAM litigation. So earlier this year, um, you all probably saw the, the first government False Claims Act action against pharmacies, and, and you're thinking, how are they going to get the pharmacies against this? They've just got pharmacists dispensing pills, according to physician prescriptions, but there's red flags that they're allegedly violating. And I think what we'll see is obviously the relator's bar uh, is smart and they know that these are deep pocket defendants with serious public interest cases. So I think we'll see them follow suit and start following these a lot. Um, one other thing that helps the relator's bar is all of these task force that Tom mentioned and, and DOJ's got their interdiction task force, which has expressly been told to use the FCA to curb opioid abuse. So now if you're a waiter's lawyer, you can turn your key tam suit in and it's not going to sit on the desk. It's going to get assigned to a resource driven group that will be able to work the case up, investigate it quickly. So I think that's will, that'll all lead to just a dramatic increase in, in these key tam cases. Katie, did you... Yeah, uh, the, and I agree with all of that. The one uptick I've seen is DEA civil inspections doing their own uh, MOAs, their memorandum of uh, agreements, which have really new provisions in them. I think you're going to be shocked by some of that. And also um, going after the provider community, health systems who have pharmacies, obviously contracted pharmacy services uh, by another entity, and just really um, looking at that. And some of them are False Claims Act cases. So I think it is kind of a collateral to the opioid crisis probably, but DEA is really active right now and more active than I've seen them in some years. So even if your client doesn't have a controlled substance in the opioid crisis realm, because they're not a distributor or, or a manufacturer, your provider community probably needs a little um, law flash or visit about their DEA uh, obligations or something, because they're coming around one thing real quick to mention on what Katie says, I agree completely. And I, I'll say that the, um, the two pharmacy cases that resulted in criminal felony charges against the pharmacist that we pursued recently both originated with DEA administrative inspections. The DEA administrative folks went into those pharmacies. Now they found significant shortages in some of the things you're talking about, but that's what really clued us in that there may be something more here. And then when we dug in and said, you know, you're billing, you know, $2 million to Georgia Medicaid on Spariva, you know, you're not actually providing to the patients, but it was the administrative folks who first got in the door. So I agree completely, uh, you know, that it, it is uh, something to take very seriously when the, you know, the regulatory DEA side comes through the door because more often than not, there may be something lurking behind that. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, another area that's always active seemingly um, uh, is uh, anti-kickback. Certainly see those uh, straight anti-kickback cases, uh, criminal and Civil False Claims Act, but also anti-kickback combined with other allegations under the False Claims Act. What are your observations about uh, cases, recent cases, anything of significance in, rela in relation to uh, the government's pursuit of anti-kickback? All right, it's going to continue to be a priority. I'll tell you, the thing that we've seen the most recently, uh, which has been in the news, and I won't go into too much detail because, uh, you know, there are ongoing cases with this, but the, the Operation Brace Yourself in April, uh, which was a telemedicine case, largely lurking behind that, though, is a massive kickback scheme. I mean, I, I, that's been charged by a number of districts uh, who have indicted cases. Um, and, it, you know, the, what I, I don't know, good or bad, but it's like good old fashioned kickbacks where it's not a, you know, there's no safe harbor issue. It's really just this straight up paying for referrals. Um, you know, hypothetically, we may have seen instances where you've got dummy invoices with a legitimate setup where there's a referral service that is no way tied to the actual number of leads sent. And you look, you look beyond that and there is a just straight up quid pro quo cash for, uh, for scripts. So that is a significant case. My hunch is that there will be some significant movement on that front. Um, but you also have the more classic kickback cases uh, where you know you you've got you know more local providers who are you know doing it uh, through some of the more civil realm and and you know we we have we see continue to see issues potentially with um, medical directorships that are you know disguised as uh, or disguised as medical directorships when they're in fact kind of a, a kickback arrangement um, some still with with the hospital systems although that's kind of tapered down a little bit. I, either we're getting worse at it or they're getting better at it. I'm not sure which. But um, it continue. It will continue to be, I think, a significant issue, um, my guess is, across the country. Katie? Well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kickbacks are really going strong. Device, uh, we've always seen them in the pharmaceutical side. And we had the device um, industry as a focus 10 years ago. And I would say it's back again with anti-kickback. And I think some of the recent settlements are interesting. Um, you know, the government is the food police when they're going after the dinners and the um, entertainment and things like that. So we've seen uh, just a recent kickback settlement on that. And I think even relationships, you know, a lot of companies um, have, I don't want to say slow, that might not be the right word, but managing the conflict of interest in relationships because there have been investigations on you know, the relationships with the sales agents and, and their relationships potentially with the hospital community. And that's, you know, you know, love can be a kickback. So you have to really, you know, uh, counsel the clients on conflict what of interest. What do you interest. mean by that? Yeah, well, that, I've asked that question actually in one of my cases. What have you got against love? Uh, but they have, there's a lot against love if, um, you know, the, print, the gatekeeper role is, is implicated. So, so that's coming up surprisingly. And companies have policies on that, but amazingly, uh, a lot don't, and neither uh, do the hospital community. And then there's some interesting cases. Kirk, are you going to talk about HCA or the... Jump the, in. Uh, the HCA case is interesting uh, because that actually was a defense case where the suggestion is the Bingham HCA case suggesting that uh, if your arrangement is fair market value, then that's an antidote to an inference that there's a kickback violation. And there's some other facts in that case that are interesting. It also has a really interesting 9B argument that is coming up in Qui Toms a lot where the relator does discovery and then amends their weak complaint during a motion to, dis well, a motion to dismiss is pending. And the court said they didn't like that. And I actually think that might be the most important part of that decision. But even on the Stark side in that decision, they, talked about you've got to connect the tainted claim or the, the improper arrangement, you know, the, the non-compliant arrangement to actual claims, which so kind of suggesting that it isn't just a strict liability uh, situation. So that, that was actually a favorable, um, I guess if you're going to call the balls and strikes that way, that was a favorable defense um, type of decision. And th this is an opinion out of the 11th Circuit this year, so. You know. Yeah, 2019 U.S. Extra Bingham versus HCA. And, and I would add to that, it's helpful because Tom was mentioning the medical director kickback schemes, which we see all the time, but 
this decision that says there can't be a fair market value kickback is something I think a lot of us in the defense floor have been arguing about. Um, and, and Tom, you're mentioning medical directors. So if I'm an inpatient rehab facility and I've got to have a medical director by regulation to supervise the facility and I've got Dr. Whitley and Dr. McAvoy and they're both equally qualified. Um, both went to Harvard, both have been practicing for 20 years, but McAvoy's got this booming geriatric practice and Whitley just doesn't like to work that much and doesn't have his practice. No, I'm just making stuff up. He's a golfer. He's a golfer. Yeah, he's a golfer. He doesn't have a big, big re referral stream. I, I do have it backwards, so let's just, <laughs> let's just switch around. So let's, let's assume that, that McAvoy's just got this huge practice. It would be economically irrational not to go with with Dr. McAvoy, and there's the second and third circuit case law that says like if it, there's any one purpose is to get those referrals, then that's a kickback. So we're hoping that this 11th circuit decision will maybe drive some more case law that, that favors that defense. I wouldn't get too excited about it though, because I think it might be wrong uh, compared <laughs> to the, the statute and some of the other case law, but it is a recognition that where you have a commercially reasonable transaction, um, you know, there, there's some immunity or something from a, from a kickback violation, and it's, it's a new idea. Yeah, it might be wrong. I'm going I'm to go with what the judges said from the left <laughs> circuit, so hopefully we get, we get some traction. Kirk, you have. So, yeah, I wanted to go back to, to what John said. The, the, I, this uh, Operation Brace Yourself was really interesting to me because it, it looked like a classic DME case that we saw in the 90s and early 2000s in the Southern District of Florida. The difference being the telemedicine component, and I think we're going to see a lot of telemedicine issues coming up. Um, I also am seeing a lot of anti-kickback cases in the diagnostic testing space. So I, I would predict those two areas would, would grow quite a bit. Um, but I, I do think the Brace Yourself, um, you'll see more cases that are like that. Um, and they can take a lot of money very quickly from the, from the program. In, in those types of schemes. <clears throat> yeah, it has been, uh, <clears throat> it's been breathtaking to see. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, the money that is flowing out, the, 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 the scope of the brace yourself and you know, potentially related schemes is substantial. And I, it is something that I think you'll see, yeah. see a, a good bit more. And if, if you look back 10, 15 years, there's a case from the Southern District of Florida called AllMed. And what was interesting about that case, it wasn't a data-driven case, but it was a diagnosis-driven case where all the claims that were coming in for braces had diagnosis of osteoarthritis. And I remember my nurse practitioner started looking at these thousands of claims for braces for osteoarthritis. And she said, well, you want people to stretch and exercise. You don't want to brace arthritic joints. So it was ab initio, you know, crooked claims. And of course, none of the braces were delivered. and. It was, and it ran up in the hundreds of millions very quickly. Well, you still see the 1-800 number if you're watching TV late, like I do occasionally, and they'll have those commercials come on that say you get a free brace. I always just call like, those. That, yeah, that, just like you brace. used to be able to get a free power wheelchair. Scooter and store. Scooter store, yeah. So, I mean, that's still happening, which I'm really surprised about. But in your everyday practice, if you're representing providers in hospice and home health, and what I've seen in the whistleblower cases is just sort of a complaint about medical necessity and then the kickback. And when you're focusing, you know, I think medical necessity is, you know, really dicey as a fraud theory to begin with. So you've really got to focus your attention on that kickback and make sure you can diffuse it or, or eliminate it from your investigation as a concern. And then you'll hopefully manage the criminal side a lot better, maybe not have a criminal case at all. But a lot of these anti-kickback violations are, are in the, I think, in the investigation because they're in the whistleblower complaint. So the government has to take a look at it. And, you know, in hospice, they have affiliations with nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Same with some of the other provider communities, or they may have their own a hospital may have its own home health or hospice. And, you know, there's just a lot of scrutiny in the area and a lot of novel kickback ideas. And as you get these subpoenas and, they, and you start to see those questions about it, if you had to focus or prioritize your investigation, the government can wait on the medical records, <laughs> but you can't wait on figuring out whether there's a kickback in your case. Because if you can figure out there's no kickback or a good argument on the kickback, then you know, you're gonna be in a lot, position your client a lot better in the investigation. Let's talk a minute about uh, parallel proceedings because I'm finding more and more of the uh, 
qui tams that I get involved in uh, either involve someone on the criminal side or did involve someone on the criminal side. Tom, I'll start with you. What are the current policies in terms of and how do you handle those when they come in as a civil action? When do they go over criminal? You're, you're cross-designated, so how does that work? Sure. So <clears throat> I think the policy is still the same. The you know, formal department policy is that parallel proceedings are a good thing. They shouldn't be abused, obviously, and that you know, the risks there that, you know, we're very cognizant of as we're evaluating these are, number one, obviously, if there's grand jury material, making sure that doesn't get to the civil side. Number two, making just sure that, you know, tools are used for their proper purpose. Uh, and number three, obviously, is not in any way to have the appearance that there is, uh, you know, a trade for any kind of criminal consideration, an extra payment of money, um, and handling that very carefully in negotiations, making sure that if there is a global resolution, it's initiated by the defendant. Uh, our policy in our office, as I said, we, you know, we have a, a kind of a unit the U.S. Attorney has set up. We are all cross-designated. If a case comes in, whether it's a, you know, a whistleblower case or a referral or an affirmative data case, we will typically have one AUSA assigned to the criminal side and one assigned to the civil side. Um, if there is merit to the criminal case, we will work it primarily criminal. Our policy is not to use grand jury unless it's absolutely necessary. So what we have typically done uh, big fans of criminal HIPAA subpoenas, uh, which can be shared with the civil side. Uh, in our office, that authority is delegated to the AUSA level, so that it's even less uh, time consuming than a CID in terms of its approval. Um, but one thing we're very careful about, which I think is important, is making sure if a defense attorney calls me and asks, uh, knowing that you know I supervise this unit, I will tell him straight out, you know, yes, there is a criminal case, this is your AUSA, this is your civil AUSA. Um, usually my hope is by the time I get that call, we have a fairly advanced investigation. Um, but we're always going to be up front with them because I think it is very important for defense attorneys, at least in the Southern District, to understand, you know, we are not trying to hang something out there to intimidate. Uh, we also, if there is no criminal case, we will make the declination before initiating civil settlement talks. We had a case recently where there was a criminal case uh, I was handling personally. We had a, a parallel civil case. Ultimately, I just didn't think I could get there on the criminal side, and I would tell the defense attorney that. And then he then proceeded to have a conversation with the civil attorney. So I know that's not maybe consistent across every office, but it is something that, you know, at least in the Southern District, we're very cognizant of. Uh, but overall, parallel proceedings, I think they're great. We're going to keep using them. Uh, I know defense attorneys and defendants hate them, uh, but we find them to be very effective. <laughs> Tom, I like them because you can say to the criminal assistant, hey, this should go civil, and you've got a robust... Civil program, I think, is a great idea. But I have seen this cross designation, mm -hmm. and the and on the sub grand jury subpoena compliance, it's going to the civil AUSA and the criminal. So how is it? And I've questioned it. I haven't had a fight about it yet. But what what if that's happening? Is that how would you handle six E if the document compliance uh, subpoena compliance is you know basically secure file transfer to both. That's a very good question. I mean, we have had agents ask us let me, how, how... Let me jump in real yeah. quick. You can just go to a judge and get an order yeah. on 60 to authorize the civil person to you look can. at the material. It, 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 we have not done that. I don't they, think they our don't court do it that would, easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I think our judges would look a little... Yeah, in District the, of Maryland, that's going to be hard. Years ago in the Southern District of Florida, it was a common practice, and most judges would agree to that pretty handily. Um, yeah. But I haven't seen a grand jury subpoena in years. Yeah, I think, you know, from our perspective, the only time we will issue a grand jury subpoena is, generally speaking, there are exceptions to this, but if we are seeking financial record, bank records in a covert criminal case, we'll issue a grand jury subpoena. Other than that, we will issue HIPAA subpoenas, which you can get all the same things. You can ask interrogatories. I mean, you have the same authority. There's no 6C limitations. Uh, I'm sure there's some local practice that varies, but I would be very, very reluctant to ever put a civil attorney on a, on a you know, return. Is it, is it fair to say that uh, when it does come in, and it, it, there has to be some judgment, I assume, in terms of whether or not it, it may have some criminal viability, mm -hmm. anti-kickback allegation, et cetera, that right. does, goes over to your criminal counterpart, does the civil side pretty much stand down at that point and not get in the way of criminal, or do they really run simultaneously? We will run them simultaneously up until a decision is made. And so if we make a decision to charge, then the civil side will step down. And part of that is just because uh, what would generally they'll stand down. And the reason for that is because 
presumably if we've got a case, we're charging it. If we can convict at trial or we get a plea agreement, you know, that largely stops a, a fight on the civil side. The only exception to that would be if there are, um, <clears throat> you know, various levels of, of culpability. So if we are charging, say, a physician and there are folks that we think have done some things that are problematic, but a False Claims Act resolution is more appropriate, we will, the civil case will go forward. Uh, you know, I know some AUSAs may be a little concerned about, um, you know, kind of the cart coming before the horse and some discovery things. You know, in Georgia, our, our district, we have a very liberal discovery policy. We basically turn over everything short of privilege. Um, and so, you know, we will, you know, do that if, if there are, um, you know, folks that we know will never go criminally but need to be, you know, we think handled in, in a civil manner. Let me move to another area uh, on, on some case law that came out this year in this out of the Supreme Court on the Cochise case dealing with the Federal False Claims Act statute of limitations issue of 10 year, six year relator versus government. Can one of you address that case? Sure. Um, I don't know that there is a statute of limitations under the False Claims Act because um, it doesn't ever seem to apply. And now <laughs> that case has extended it further where a relator can take advantage of the three-year period that most people thought was reserved for the government. So now a relator can, can take advantage of that to have a violation that goes back 10 years. And the problem with it for uh, clients and, and defen defense counsel is, you know, the, the lawsuit can be filed in 2008 and sit under seal for five years, and then it gets unsealed. And it's been told since 2008, so now it goes all the way back to 1998, and you're literally fighting over violation, alleged violations that took, took place 20 years ago. Um, so that's that's what the Supreme Supreme Court held, and we can expect. You know, the one downside, Jack, is it could encourage relators to sit on information um, and, and file later, so that they can take advantage of the the three year window. And that's what the relator did in the Cochise case. Um, so that that's one potential downfall. Katie, you had a comment. Well, th this case had a lot of Amicus participation, and there is a concern that. I think what Justice Thomas said, and he also did Escobar, his False Claims Act opinions are really terrific. They're very concise. So at least you know how the statute's being interpreted because nobody really knew how to work that three-year provision anyway. That was a tolling provision for the government. It's now a tolling provision for the relator, and everybody gets 10 years. And I, I agree with Jason, the, but there, there's really a bigger picture to all of this because it's probably just a subset of cases that are affected but remember, these whistleblower cases generate a lot of criminal activity. That was a criminal case where the relator was actually in jail for a kickback scheme. He had disclosed this, uh, a second scheme to the FBI. So there's a question about is that disclosure sufficient to trigger uh, the government official um, uh, uh, part of the statute of limitations. Uh, who's a government official? Is it FBI, DOJ? That's what was left open by the Supreme Court. But importantly, they said it was not the whistleblower because there was actually a brief in there that said the whistleblower is a government official. So fortunately, they cleaned that up and, and rejected that entirely. But the, you know, I've always said the procedural issues in False Claims Act practice, which are so potent, are why this statute is kind of out of equipose, if you will, on, there's like a lack of symmetry. Uh, when you look at this statute, to Jason's point, uh, if you look at these stats for 20, since 1986, is that 20 or 30 years? I'm not sure, I think it's 30, I don't know, <laughs> however long that is. Um, there's all, the data shows that 80% of these cases are declined. So if you have a declined case that has a statute issue, you're really affected by it. But it also shows that there's this um, sort of chaos and ineffectiveness in the statute when you have sustained declination rates that high. So what I thought could have been done or should be done in this situation is to not look at it as just a statute of limitations, but look at it as a seal issue. You know, the duration of seal is infinite. The statute of limitations seems infinite. And it's very hard to, to manage the equity of the statute when you combine all of these procedural inequities together. And I think that's what makes the statute of limitations issue powerful. And I'll say here that I say everywhere I go, these cases shouldn't be under seal so long. Everyone who thinks that it's good to be under seal for a long time, you're wrong. 
Just ask these folks who had to go to the Supreme Court when the case was under seal for so long. They're still in court battling. So I think this is pressure and I think the statute should be amended uh, to, to really deal with the inequities of the seal issue. I, so I totally agree with that, Katie. And, and there are some defendants who say, whatever, it's under seal. But if you've got a client that's trying to sell or one of those issues, well, they've, gotten, they've got a buyer and all they know is there's a CID and there's nothing you can do about it. So that, that seal issue can really serve to, to harm the defendant. And then you get into discovery 10 years later witnesses aren't around, and that can, that can hurt through a later Well, that's government. happened to me. I've had witnesses die. But the other issue on the statute of limitations is this new idea in the last five years that you can partially intervene. So the relators will say, well, the government's settling the covered conduct under you know, theory <laughs> A and B, but D, D and E, and this actually happened to me in Atlanta, where the relator said, well, I get to go forward on D and E, so you should settle that with me. <laughs> like, well, fortunately, the U.S. Attorney's Office shut that down. But this whole issue, there's actually a Ninth Circuit case on it. Can you partially intervene piecemeal in a, a whistleblower case and leave the rest of it open? and your client vulnerable to the rest of the complaint allegations. And Justice Thomas, again, if you look at this uh, decision, it's actually very favorable, I think, uh, because it says no. When he did the statutory construction on the 10 years, he said you intervene in an action. You don't intervene piecemeal um, into a case. So that's actually highly favorable. And hopefully this is going to get litigated. It's been litigated, I think half a dozen times, this issue of partial, uh, declinations or partial interventions, whatever the nomenclature is. And if you're dealing with a settlement agreement, you have to be really cognizant of it. So if case proceeds into the settlement deal is, is reached, just a related issue when you're settling that, the, the whole issue of drafting the settlement agreement, what's the scope of covered conduct, which defines kind of the scope of the release, if you will. Um, why are these, I mean, Tom, they're pretty narrowly drafted by the department. I've been in some real fights where they want to come in and, you know, they've, they've broadly investigated uh, many, many different issues. Right. And then they want to define the only thing you get the release on a lot more narrowly than what they investigated. Yeah, that definitely is the policy. You know, it... Um, <clears throat> and, until the Clarkson memo comes that's out. That's right. Which is not being issued. Uh, <laughs> you know, I understand the, you know, the policy behind it is, you know, kind of get what you pay for. You know, our local practice, if we, if we are settling a case and we're defining the covered conduct that, you know, almost invariably is less than what the relator originally alleged, or maybe even potentially, <clears throat> if it's a proactive case, what we set out to investigate, uh, we will accompany the settlement agreement with a, you know, in writing declaration that the following issues, A, B, C, and D were investigated, and we find them, you know, not to have any merit. We'll do that in declined cases um, for those issues which we believe do not have merit. If it's a case in which we either don't have the resources to do or even the litigation risk is just too high, we wouldn't issue a letter in that case. But I am sympathetic to the, you know, defendants that we run into who say, you know, there either is an issue or there's not, make a call. And so we will take steps to, um, within the you know, environment that we work in and working with OSIG and, and when applicable civil frauds, uh, we'll do the things that we can do to try to give a defendant some comfort so at least they have something in the file that if you know, <clears throat> Northern District of Georgia were to ever circle on the backside, they can say, hold up, no, they, this was looked at you know, um, again, not a you know, magic bullet, but you know, we do take steps um, where we can to try to address that issue. What about it is one that I experience yeah. of the panelists, the other panelists? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just offer this one experience in one of the hospice cases we litigated, where the relator took the position they could uh, government intervened on their own complaint, and the relator took the position they could do discovery on the non-intervened uh, allegations, and I think that's wrong, and. You know, the, so it comes up in a variety of different contexts, this idea that the relator has the authority to pursue non-intervened allegations. And then, you know, it gets really expensive and messy. Yeah, so my experience is always, I go for the broadest release I can get from my client and the government always comes back and says, we're only gonna release what we investigated. And I try to nudge them to, to make it as broad as possible. But after listening to you, I want all my cases down in Savannah. <laughs> so.
I agree with that. Well, when you do a False Claims Act settlement, you will get a commercial release from the relator, and you will get the complaint dismissed with prejudice. You have to take that position and make sure your agreement looks like that. But there, you're not going to get a release for the non-intervened allegations. So that's, you know, so that's the part you have to negotiate and make sure you get that commercial release from the relator. And well, you're also often not going to get the release from the state. So if it's a QTAM complaint that names 10 states, if they're not getting a significant portion of the settlement recovery, then you'll get a dismissal with prejudice. But sometimes the, the defendant will say, hey, I want to, I want to pay for, for, for global peace here. But rarely will the states sign off on that, on that settlement. And one thing we do related to this, if, even if it's not an issue for like a corporate defendant, if it is a, you know, if it's a CEO where we had, you know, like I, I, I'm thinking of an example. We had a case with civil frauds where they, we, we actually demanded a settlement from an individual as part of this, you know, the resolution. Ultimately, we didn't end up <clears throat> requiring that, um, <clears throat> but we weren't going to give a release to the individual. Excuse me. <clears throat> we weren't going to give a release to the individual. But there was also some hesitation to not provide even a letter saying, you know, this person that we have taken an affirmative position, at least in correspondence, has got culpability. We're just going to leave them hanging. You know, what ended up happening was our office issued a letter on our office's letterhead saying, you know, it's our district and we don't think, you know, CEO John Smith has, any, you know, culpability that we intend to pursue at this time. Um, but, you know, when you are looking at that interaction between the corporate corporations and the individuals, that's another you know, I issue we see pop up from time to time. What about defense counsel on the panel, your experiences and, and strategies, tactics in relation to any carve outs on the retaliation claim, the age claim or the attorney's fee and expense claims by relators counsel? Yeah, carve out. I mean, that's your big threat. Your big leverage is to say, I'll do a carve out. And it is DOJ policy to allow the carve out. So I, I've had this countless times where the relator comes in with a million dollar retaliation claim, a million dollar attorney fee thing on a little case. And you say, OK, well, we'll have to deal with you separately. And you carve out the jurisdiction um, for those issues. You leave jurisdiction with the court to resolve the fee petition and the retaliation claim. And then you just settle with the government. And DOJ has been really good about saying, we're going to settle the False Claims Act case. So you'll get your relator's release. You'll get the case dismissed with prejudice. And then the carve out, um, the court will retain jurisdiction for the carve out only. And it, that's been very successful in getting the relators to come to the table and be more reasonable. Though I've had to litigate a few to be more reasonable on their demands. And then you can hopefully get a global settlement. But if you can't, and it's not reasonable, there, you should be asking for those carve outs because they make sense. I, I always go for a global settlement and try to make sure that I can wrap everything up. I have more trouble sometimes with certain state AGs than I have with relators. Um, it de depends on the relators council, but there are certain yeah. states where I, that have opted out of settlements that have you know, basically compromised the whole deal. Um, and it takes a lot of work by a good AUSA to yeah. corral all of the assistant attorneys general to get them to where they need to be. But we, I think, rely on the AUSAs to try to do that more than we rely on the National Association of Attorneys General. Another area where there may have been some uptick uh, in enforcement is in relation to electronic health records. Uh, I think that was something, Jason, that, that you mentioned. That sure. So um, you all might have saw, seen the Greenway settlement earlier this year. It's just another target for the relators bar to go after. I mean, you can only sue the same hospital so many times. So if you can find other folks who are causing the hospital to submit potentially false claims, and that's an inroad. Um, I think we'll also see more, as we talked about earlier, anytime there's a hot button issue in, in the press, um, where there's you know, deep pockets and, and public interest. Right now, data breaches are, are obviously significant, and everyone in here has probably gotten a notice that your personal information has been misused. So you could see where maybe the next wave, we've seen it in cybersecurity, you could see it at hospitals or big healthcare systems that instead of just a HIPAA breach, someone could file a False Claims Act uh, based on that. So that could be sort of the next, next wave of, of key TAMs. Let's shift gears uh, to the, the relatively new policy from May of this year relating to uh, uh, the False Claims Act. Uh, and we're not going to cover, we're going to go into that in a little, a little bit more detail, but everyone, we're not going to talk about 
kind of the litany of history of policies, uh, because this is fairly independent, but everyone here knows the DOJ policies reflected now in the, uh, the, the U.S. Attorney's Manual, the Justice Manual, in relation to the prosecution of business entities and, and individuals. Uh, we went through the whole, you know, from Thompson in 03 to McNulty to Phillip to on and on and on. And then in comes uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. He issues something in November of 17, I guess it was, in relation to sub-regulatory guidance. Uh, the brand memo followed uh, early in 18. Um, and, and the Yates memo has, and I think there's gonna be a panel later talking about Yates memo this afternoon, some changes. That had some changes. Uh, and this all leads up to what happened in, in May, uh, the policies entitled Guidelines for Taking Disclosure, Cooperation, and Remediation into Account in False Claims Act Matters. It's been pulled into the U.S. Attorney's Manual uh, or the Justice Manual. Uh, what panel, what, what is that about? What's the purpose? Why this new policy? So, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, from my perspective, I think it's a great policy. I mean, it, you know, historically, and I'm thinking of a couple of cases in particular, you know, we have had to be very creative in ways to justify settlements uh, for defendants to make a number work uh, <clears throat> within the confines, you know, of, of kind of the traditional, you know, double damages methodology. And so I think having something on paper, which, you know, we can point to, whether it's a U.S. attorney or, you know, an agency, uh, to make a settlement work, I think is important. And, and we take it very seriously. I mean, if, if a defendant is coming in early to us, or even if after they've received a subpoena or a CID, if they're saying, hey, we've, you know, we've taken two months and looked into this, and you know, A, B, and C are garbage, and you know, either you or the relator are wrong, but D, you know, let's talk about that. I mean, there are significant benefits we're willing to give you know, the reason for that is a couple fold. You know, number one, I think it, it just saves us time. We, you know, we want to get from A to the end of, you know, A to B as quickly as possible. Uh, number two, I think it shows a significant amount of good faith. Um, and so we have a, you know, if, if providers are working with us, we want to work with them. Uh, and that will include, you know, solving some of the relator issues that have been alluded to, working with the agency partners. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of the policy. I, I've seen defense counsel use it very effectively. Um, and I, I, you know, if you're not familiar with it, I would strongly urge you to, to take a close look. Katie? Yeah, I, I think this is a great thing too. And it's, and I, I think again, if you look at it in context to DOJ uh, having a dismissal memo, then having an FCA cooperation memo, I look at it as DOJ taking back responsibility for the statute and not just leaving it, you know, for the whistleblowers to set the agenda. And I think it's a really good thing. There, there are deviations from 20 or 30 years of practice in this memo that I think are terrific. One is uh, DOJ always said, I can't interfere with administrative remedies. I can't help you with the relator. Some would, some wouldn't. But this policy in writing says cooperation can be non-monetary. So it can be assistance with the relator, uh, helping to get things resolved. It can be assistance with the administrative agency that may have its own remedy. So it kind of makes parallel proceedings work better if they have the opportunity to work in non-monetary ways. I think that's very significant. The other thing that I think is terrific is that it says in writing, we'll give you credit for your compliance efforts during the investigation. So it's not all lost, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, the OIG, HHS OIG takes the position that anything you do after the subpoena doesn't count when they're assessing risk for a corporate integrity agreement, which I think is frankly a very unwise position. Uh, but DOJ says, no, we are gonna consider what you tried to do during the investigation uh, to remedy it. And then the last thing that I think remains to be seen about it, which is kind of interesting, I'm not really sure what to think about this yet, but it says that um, we're not gonna give you credit uh, for things you're required to do by law. So you're required to return overpayments and you're required to report public health and safety types of violations. So it'll, uh, then on the other hand, it says, well, we'll try to work out partial credit. So I wouldn't lose um, uh, hope that you couldn't get a good result even if it's a, um, 
uh, issue related to required by law. So that, that may be helpful. So I think all these things are, are terrific. I haven't yet seen the, the money really come down on the multiplier, so we'll have to see. But I think, uh, I think DOJ was working out the money issues pretty well before then. But if you say I want to pay an overpayment and I still want a False Claims Act release, I don't know if you're still going to be able to get that without some multiplier, but maybe there's an opportunity to have your cake and eat it too under this policy. One other point on that about the required by law, and, and I'm sure you all have heard this, is AUSAs will say subpoena compliance doesn't get you credit. That's required. So I think it, it shifted defense strategy instead of just turning over the documents and, and giving it to them and letting them you know, try to find stuff is having more of a kind of facilitating the investigation defense and, and actually pointing out where you see issues. So where Tom mentioned, if you can identify in a subpoena, if it's kickback, medical necessity, and one other thing, you say these three things we're fine on, but there is issue here. We've identified some, some emails that we've got to drill down on. If you get that to the government early, um, we've seen, we've seen some, some credit come out of that. You know, the policy, and I agree with <clears throat> what everyone said, I think it's a great policy. If you haven't seen it, it's worth uh, closely studying because it is something that you're going to want to make use of and try to get as many of those credits if you're heading that direction as you can. Uh, the policy speaks to, uh, says to earn maximum credit. Uh, you should undertake timely self-disclosure, uh, provide full cooperation, take remedial steps. But then it goes on to say uh, you may receive partial credit if they have meaningful, meaningfully assisted the government's investigation by engaging in conduct qualifying for cooperation credit, goes on to say that most often this discretion, and the DOJ has great discretion under this policy, they're not bound by anything, uh, most often this discretion will be exercised by reducing the penalties or damages uh, multiple sought by the department. So, you know, Tom, you get a... Uh, uh, I go in for what I like to call the shock and awe show that the where you're summoned in and up comes a PowerPoint and uh, maybe a sample and you see some enormous numbers, pick a number. You put 20 million on the board. Um, it's not been a self-disclosure, but then just assume that a uh, provider defendant uh, fully cooperates, uh, remediates, works on its compliance program, and they come in and convince you that in fact, the real exposure is just $2 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Historically, the, the, the settlement point would be double damages mm -hmm. from there, so let's say four million. Uh, would you, in light of recognizing that type of cooperation, even though you started at 20, take it down from a double multiplier, now you might be at one and a half at three million on the settlement? So I probably would if the, you know, the uh, you know, cooperation was paired with, you know, show me that this isn't gonna happen again. <clears throat> so if you have instituted new measures to prevent you know, X, Y, or Z from happening before, uh, I've seen defense attorneys very effectively say, you know, we think the number should be X. You know, here's the CEO, here's the board. You have your, you know, you go talk to them and you can poke around and see if what we're telling you is right. Uh, I do, and, I, and the reason for that, I think, is two reasons. One, you know, it's a, I see a lot of the same players on the defensive side fairly frequently. And what I, you know, I think it kind of shoot, you shoot yourself in the foot if I say, you come in, you do all this good faith stuff, and like, well, the multiplier is now 2.4. Like, you know, every time you send me an annoying email, it goes up. They're not going to do that the next time, and I want to incentivize both the defendant and a provider to work with us, and there's value to me to doing that, so I would re reduce it for that. And the second thing is, at least, you know, in our district, you know, we measure on the civil side, obviously, the dollars in the door and what we're recovering, but we also keep track of spend in future years that we've avoided. So an example is, you know, three years ago, very quietly, we resolved about a dozen ambulance cases. Didn't issue a press release, we just resolved them. Because Georgia had an extremely high reimbursement for ambulances, and particularly in the Southern District, we saw that as a problem. We just, result, we just said, pay back the money, no multiplier, don't do it again. And we just watched the numbers and they came down. And so instead of fighting about, you know, a 2.1, 2.2, 1.7, um, we actually ended up saving Medicare more money because in the, you know, three year time period, they stopped doing it. So I see a lot of value in trying to build collaborative relationships when you can. And obviously you can't always do that. But um, part of that is rewarding conduct that you want to see happen in the future. You had mentioned uh, Michael Granston uh, fondly, and I'll tell him that as well <laughs> when I next see him. Um, 
the Grand Memo has been out for a little while, of course. There have not been that many cases thus far, but not an insignificant number that uh, where the departments come in and, and move to dismiss. Uh, the Grand Memo sets forth about seven different factors to be uh, considered in relation to that. They're going to decline intervention uh, should they go ahead and dismiss. But even if the department makes that decision, courts are in the middle of it in terms of whether they enter a dismissal order or not. So what are the differing standards out there? The courts vary on this and how they view whether or not uh, the department has unfettered discretion or so well, there's some other test. Well, this is, this is an area where there's a circuit split and I don't want to get into a prolonged legal discussion, but I've certainly seen and had DOJ move in my cases to dismiss a key TAM where the judge has really questioned uh, the AUSA about the scope of the investigation and adopted the less deferential standard. Um, it, the case is currently pending in this Seventh Circuit, so I don't want to be in, in too much detail about it. Um, my view has always been that the real party and in interest in Akitam is the United States government and the Department of Justice has authority to decline, and, and that's the position we take. You're in an awkward position as a defendant in these cases because you really want to sit back and let the department make its motion and not say much of anything, in, in, in my estimation. But then if you hit a rough spot, you're, you're subject potentially to discovery and all kinds of other things. Luckily, I've had the whole case stayed while it's on appeal to the circuit. Um, but it can get very expensive very quickly if, if the judge lets the relator go, go forward with discovery in a case where the government has moved to dismiss. And, and that's a position I found myself in the last couple months. So, um, you know, I, I like to see the government. We see so many key TAMs that on the face of them, I mean, one, one of the reasons we have a declination rate of 75, 80% over the last 33, 35 years is that there are a lot of garbage key TAM cases that are filed by attorneys who don't do this on a regular basis, um, and they misunderstand a rule, regulation, whatever, and they file a key TAM, and the AUSA gets it and, and chooses to decline, and usually they can be dismissed or not even served in, in a lot of cases. Katie, so, you had a comment as well? Well, I mean, this, this is another thing that was a seismic change. Um, when I was in AUSA, I used to ask uh, no, I didn't really ask, I never asked, I don't think I asked forgiveness, but we used to dismiss <laughs> cases in the District of Maryland, and one was the Library of Congress case, where the Library of Congress was sued, and I intervened and dismissed it and got yelled at. But there was a real um, preference against intervening and dismissing, and you had the Sequoia case that for years was like practically the only thing out there where it had this very low standard the government had to show. So when the DOJ issued their dismissal memo, uh, and I have had a lot of dismissals, particularly on the provider medical necessity cases. I think I've had four this year alone where DOJ intervened and dismissed. And all that was left was the retaliation claim. So I am loving this policy and they were junk cases. So again, again, this procedural inefficiency, et cetera, is well addressed uh, by this policy. What I think is shocking is that the Article Three side of our government is saying, whoa, <coughs> I want you to ha show a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, you know, somehow the government has to justify to the judicial branch that they can intervene and dismiss their own case, basically. And I think this, again, the equipose of the statute constitutionally is disrupted uh, by that. So it's going to be fascinating to see how it works itself out. But in a couple of cases, there's a request really for the government to show what they did or how, if they are dismissing it because they think it's, it's not a good use of their time, which actually Granson said they weren't going to do it for discovery, but apparently it's happened a few times, then somehow the government has to justify why they, on behalf of the United States, don't want to litigate the case. And because the relator, again, stands in the shoes as a mere assignee uh, or agent of the government, it's really hard to understand why the government doesn't have what the DC Circuit has said in the Swift case, unfettered discretion to say, and if you were an AUSA and somebody brought a case to you, the FBI brings you a case organically, right? And you say, this is a dog, like an ambulance case. This is a dog, let's get rid of it. Um, I'm not doing it. Uh, you don't have to answer to the court for that. So why do you have to answer to the court when it's a quitom? So this is an 
absolutely fascinating uh, situation that's developing. And I just don't want DOJ to get gun shy on dismissing junk cases uh, that have been hanging around for years and they're just really uh, ought to be off off the table anyway. And so anyway, that's just a little bit of a speech. I think I went over 90 seconds. No, no, but I, I've <laughs> also <laughs> always taken the position that a relator doesn't have any real interest in the case until there's a verdict, right? Until there is... Uh, something that says they're entitled to to funds, they don't have any interest. And I've, I've made that argument also. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Jason, you brought to our attention a, a recent motion to dismiss filed in this Polinsky case. What is that about? So I would not recommend doing this in Tom's district, but recently the government declined to intervene in the case and let the relator go forward with it. And the defense counsel just started bombarding the government with, with discovery requests and all sorts of TUI requests. And the government had like five attorneys whose only job was to respond to discovery in that litigation. So the government moved to dismiss on that grounds. And so, I mean, that's, that's one strategy, assuming your discovery requests are, are made in good faith. It, it costs the government resources that they've already decided are not worth pursuing. Which is one of the delineated factors in the, in the Granston memo. Yeah, okay. And when, just in your experience, um, again, defense attorneys, um, you're dealing with an AUSA in a given district. When do you take something o over his or her head uh, if, they're, if they're declining uh, to intervene and uh, that district is not interested in moving to dismiss? Do you ever go up to the department? What are your strategies and experiences in terms of moving up all the way up to Grandston or whomever it may take? Yeah. And what type of reception have you had? And what's the downside with attempting to do it? Yeah, I would not go over an office's head if I got a declination. And I have had situations where you get the declination and the AUSA says, I think the relator will dismiss and you have a skirmish and you may get to the scheduling order side and all of a sudden the case goes away. So I would be very patient and I would keep working the AUSA to nudge the relator's counsel to dismiss the case and if there's a retaliation, you know, obviously take care of that. But if you can get DOJ to decline, I don't think I want anyone in Washington looking at the case because uh, they may disagree. <laughs> they may say, no, you should have intervened in this case. <laughs> so get a declination, run with it and work the system to try to get your dismissal. Um, on a couple of them, and I think they were in Texas, um, the, I didn't even know the government was going to decline. They declined, intervened and dismissed. And I found out about it. After the fact, I'd had a lot of dialogue, but I wasn't privy to the, to the decision. The one strategy that I think is important for the defense counsel is that if it looks like it's going your way and you're worried you'll be stuck with an obstreperous relator situation, is to see if the AUSA will give you the heads up on the declination and the timing of it and then see if you can have direct communications with the relator on resolving their retaliation. So you can kind of wrap it up or move it along. And uh, in many districts, the AUSAs are willing to be proactive in that sense and involve you. And then some, they're like, no, I don't want you to have anything to do with it. But I would always try to, to see what you could work out. Because most of the relators counsel, in my experience, are pretty reasonable. And then you have you know, the ones that you're not gonna be able to work with as well. Yeah, I think it's case by case, but if you have a case that you really feel like it's important for some procedural reason or policy reason to get a, a motion to dismiss, I always go to the AUSA, make my case uh, through that office, and then if it has to go further, um, ask that office to assist in that process. Haven't done it thus far. Most of the time, if I'm in this position, I do what Katie suggested, which is take my declination and keep my mouth shut and deal with the the relator in court. Um. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you all said. I, for me, my success has been really based on the status of the defendant. So if it's you know big, large hospital chain, you might not have as much success, but if it's small charity hospital in, in rural Georgia and the government's made the decision that the case is a dog, that's where I've had some success is, <clears throat> hey, this is not a, a large commercial institution that's got funds dedicated to litigation. I've had success getting dismissals on those grounds. You know, an area that's still so important out there and, and is yet undecided uh, is the, at least there's no consensus amongst the courts and, and not many take it to that point of litigation, uh, but the whole area of, of sampling and extrapolation in the False Claims Act arena. So in my experience to get to really big numbers, you know, while the government may have some factual falsity, evidence of 
uh, a nurse falsified something in the medical record to get the, the patient, uh, the claim uh, supported. Uh, they may have misled a certifying physician, whatever it might be. That's, that's fraud. May not add up to a lot of money. To get to the big dollars, pull the sample, get an expert. A government gets an expert. They may drive a pretty high error rate. We know what that does in the math. You might have tens of millions of dollars on the board, and yet the courts are still unsettled on it. You had the life care case uh, in East Tennessee. Judge said it's coming in. Case settled for a lot of money. Well, mm-hmm. relative to, to oh, the yeah. claim, I don't know. Oh, so uh, then you had Agape in South Carolina. A uh, judge said, I'm not letting it in. They took it up. Uh, or Circuit kicked it back uh, on the interlocutory appeal and said we were in Provident, I think it was, in, in reviewing not just the settlement piece with the DOJ, but this extrapolation, we kick it back to the court. District court judge wasn't gonna have anything to do with it and it settled for like less than a million dollars, I think it was. Um, Where does this stand now? Uh, A lot of these I've seen in the area of medical necessity uh, where um, the falsity will be based upon an allegation that the service is rendered, whether it's hospice or home health or whatever the area might be, were not really medically necessary uh, what have been your experiences in that area? Have you seen it increase, decrease? Again, defense lawyers first, your observations of how the department is viewing these things now. Yeah. Well, it, it's still happening. I mean, they're still extrapolating in the conference room. I think there's been some br- big successes in bringing the numbers down, if you can work it. And what I think the biggest advocate for the defense in sampling and extrapolation in the conference room, if you will, is CMS. CMS has a lot of guidance out that is very favorable to the defense on sampling and extrapolation. And there are several Medicare council opinions um, that are highly favorable to a practical analysis of sampling and extrapolation. And it's the way we've been able to get numbers much, much lower uh, than we would like. But we always hear there's DOJ policy to do the higher bound cherry pick samples, all the criticisms are, are still in play in all of the medical necessity cases. And um, so I think you have to really have a pitched uh, strategy to focus on how you can get you know, the dollars down just, just in the conference room. If you go to trial, it's, it's gonna be just you know, clash of experts. And the, the only thing, and Kirk, uh, we were talking about this is, um, and Jack had alerted us to this Hodge case. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Thank yeah, you. the Hodge case is interesting because it isn't a healthcare case, uh, but it had an, it's a mortgage style case and it had an extrapolation issue. And what happened in that case, and I don't think it has precedential value for sampling, but I think as a practice pointer, it's pretty good because they agreed on the sample and then uh, really undermined themselves in being able to then attack the sample and the methodology. And you know when you're in litigation and doing your scheduling orders and all this stuff, there's all this pressure to agree and stipulate to things. And when you're in the sample and extrapolation arena, the minute you go down the path of agreeing on the sample, you may have just lost your case uh, for the important part of it, which is damages. And so I think you may not want to be stipulating or agreeing to anything uh, or make sure you're preserving your objections. But attacking the sample, I love the life care decision. Everyone hates it, but I think it's a great defense decision because what the judge said there is you can attack the sample and the methodology by any means. You're not limited. And you can impeach every, you can go patient by patient and impeach the sample and undermine it. You don't have to just get an expert to attack the so-called methodology. So I like the life care decision. I think it gives you a lot of leeway to attack things and impeach it. But the best thing to do, I think, is not to agree that you know these cases should have extrapolation at all or that you should have a trial on that. And in the hospice cases where they say death is an art, not a science, then I don't know why we're having extrapolation to begin with because if we don't, It's not like a lab case where everything's uniform, right? Each patient's gonna be different. So I would not agree to stipulate to samples. I think it's gonna kill your case. So I I have samples in almost three phases that I I consider. And technically, um, you know, we almost always use rad stats and I'm technically fine 
with Radstats and how that works. What I find is the government in many cases will hire an expert recommended by a relator, use the relator's expert, and go into an, a review with a lot of confirmation bias. So just imagine if you're a doctor or a nurse and you've been asked to do a review by the FBI and you sit down and like, here's what we're investigating and they tell them, you know, this is a medical necessity case and here's what we think is going. You generate in your sample bias. And then as a criminal defense attorney, obviously we see sampling for sentencing purposes. And I'll give you one example where um, in the last uh, healthcare criminal trial I had, the FBI threw away the seed number when they pulled the sample. So there was no way for me to recreate or test whether the people in the sample uh, were actually randomly drawn. But what I was able to figure out through discovery was that the FBI agent was throwing in patients into the sample that they liked because of specific facts and in interviews. You might think this sounds great and the judge would be all over it. The judge threw out the expert and wouldn't let the expert t testify about the sample at trial, but then he turned around at sentencing and said the standard's different at sentencing and I think that, you know, they, you know, they might have screwed it up a little, and I don't know about whether there were good faith here, but I kind of rely on this to send your client to jail for 20 years. So you have issues in sampling, and it really depends on the stage that you're at. But I agree with Katie, stipulating for convenience early in a case to a sampling methodology before you really understand what the allegations are, uh, who, who the physicians are, or who was making the decisions, you really need to get to a point where you make agreements based on a, a full understanding of what's going on. And then it also helps to say, if we're gonna agree to, to do a sample, the defense is gonna go out and try to find uh, a, a neutral reviewer, and we're not gonna tell them in advance. And you want the, the government to agree to that same sort of parameter so that you do get a fair sample. Because if the government says, I'm going with the, they're not gonna tell you this, but I'm going with the relators uh, expert or the relator is a physician and the relator is going to weigh in, uh, I'm going to go out and find the most aggressive person on my side. And then you're going to end up in a situation that's not very useful to, to anybody. But what happens at the end of the day if you come back and the sample or the results are so close that the gov I would hope the government would say, well, you know, there's, uh, we don't find that these results are indicative of fraud, right? CMS has rules about, you know, error rates and and claims error rates, and, and we expect uh, variation and difference. So when you do a sample, you're gonna have an expert disagree a certain amount of time uh, just because they're, you're relying on someone's opinion. Let me, we just have a minute left. Uh, so we get to CMS suspensions uh, very briefly. I've seen more than may just be the cases I'm in, uh, and I've even had AUSA, so that there's a QUITAM file, there might be a a search warrant that comes after that, it ends up with the AUSM and one that's been out there for five years and the suspension has continued, partial suspension. I know the department has to deal with Escobar materiality issues. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, if the claim at issue is paid, then that's very strong evidence of lack of materiality. And I'm finding CMS sitting on the suspended dollars, uh, you know, there's no real due process there, you wait. And can the department, can the, uh, uh, AUSA make use of that as leverage in terms of trying to negotiate a resolution. It's a lot I've thrown at you. So if you have any comments quick, we'll wrap up with, on that. With a minute, I'll just jump in. We're talking about the provision that says the government can suspend on credible allegations of fraud. I always interpreted, at least when I was in the government, the word fraud meaning like criminal fraud, like real fraud. The problem comes in when you have a False Claims Act case, is, is a stark violation fraud? It is a allegation of a, of a kickback that's not fleshed out fraud. The problem is if you suspend um, in a key TAM case, particularly with a corporate client, um, you're out of business before you get a chance to even do an internal investigation. Um, and I've had three challenges to CMS. Um, the first one, CMS really backed out and declined to go to court and fight and just agreed to pay. The second one, you know, when, the, when a federal agent comes in and says there are credible allegations of fraud, what is a judge to do? Because the, the rule is, is pretty clear. So in the second one I lost, client went into bankruptcy. Not only was there uh, not a key TAM settlement that favored the government, but um, what ended up happening in the dissolution of the business was it cost the government multiples 
of what it would have cost to settle because all the cardiologists went to work at hospitals and ended up billing through an inpatient rather than an outpatient setting. And then the third one, rather than go to court and file an injunction action and try to fight, I just went straight to CMS, tried to negotiate and explain to them, uh, I believe there's a key TAM, here's what's going on. If you hold this suspension, we're out of business and we're done and you can talk to a bankruptcy uh, judge and, and in that situation, after going through all the facts, um, CMS agreed to lift the suspension. So it's really a question of, are they suspending in a False Claims Act context where it's really a civil type of allegation, but it puts tremendous pressure and leverage over your client to settle if you're not getting paid, because not many people can survive without Medicare and Medicaid payments. Great comments, thank you. And please join me in thanking the panel. They did a great job.